Greetings students and welcome to week nine. This week we're exploring social media and search in part one and in part two you'll look at social media curation. So our essential questions this week are how might we search social media and why should we bother? What is social media curation? Why should we curate social media and other free content and resources? How might we crowdsource search? Is social media curation part of an information professional's practice? And what role does social media, or do social media, play in our search toolkits? So the agenda for this week is why bother with social media in search? Some major platforms that I think are search worthy, social media search tools, crowdsourcing and communities of practice as information strategies, and curation for search and personal knowledge management. I believe that search is social and that social media tools are search tools. And as columnist Paul Shapiro says, search and social do not have to live in separate silos. I think they complement each other very well. Why search in social media? Several reasons. Social media is a rich sor source of news and will keep you aware in your niche area of interest. You will find information from conversations and communities of practice and niche interest groups. Uh, you can retrieve detailed and up-to-date information from a wide range of social networking sites simultaneously. You can judge and decide whether or not to use what we call the wisdom of the crowd. And sometimes you get a very uh, personalized flow of information. The types of content you'll find on social media Real-time information and news, information about niche products and services, public opinion, gossip and rumors, local news, community-related events and activities, business and marketing information, user-generated images and videos, and all sorts of media. About the value of social media content, uh, just as anything, the quality of the content from social blogs uh, owned by experts in various domains will, will vary. Um, you will get a constant production of a tremendous amount of data. It will be a rapid, rapid distribution of current information. The information will come from diverse viewpoints if you seek it and sometimes if you don't. And you may often get peripheral information. So in almost every case with social media content, you need to behave as a filter or you need to teach the per people you work with how to behave as filters themselves. Now let's look at some of the really standby and pretty fabulous tools for searching social media. Um, I search Twitter a lot and um, what you'll notice here is that from um, my, the hashtag that I created a while back, TL or Teacher Librarian Chat, um, I can search that hashtag and pretty much keep my finger on the pulse of that large community. And if I pull down the more options under my hashtag search over there, and I think I was just in search.twitter.com, I can uh, see that I can search twi uh, tweets or individual accounts, or as you can see across the top two, photos, videos, news from everybody, just the people I follow. Uh, I can make this a local search only by searching people near me. Um, I could save my searches. I can embed my searches. In fact, I can set up the Twitter feeds, um, a Twitter feed like I did in our in our lib guide. I can see what my recent searches are and redo them if I like. Um, on the right, you see just isolating for images. Um, I can also uh, take a look, as you see on the left, at trends if I just want to catch up with what's going, what people are talking about. Um, so it's a powerful tool just by using uh, search.twitter.com. Um, but what you can do with it, if you, you know, even without joining it, is search individual people or organizations with, with at signs or handles. And so I just went into NPR politics, and their feed is, is pretty remarkable if you want to know what's going on in the world of politics. Uh, but what's also interesting is, um, in addition to following them and, and their, their feed, what you can do is... Um, you can follow, I, I think that what's more valuable than following people who are following NPR politics is looking at the people 
and the groups that NPR politics is following. Because if a major organization is following somebody, that gives them a little bit more credibility, I think. And it may be, it may turn out if you're interested in politics, that those are people you want to follow and you may find something even more valuable than your original contact. Um, Twitter is used heavily in terms of search and also for um, research studies. Um, the world leaders and major international organizations have Twitter feeds and likely they're not individually or personally tweeting, but they have surrogates who are tweeting for them. Um, and you will find, um, you can actually find out news fastest when you're um, following a feed that issues press releases or transcripts of speeches. Um, and you can see, you can tell a lot by who's following whom. And Twiplomacy um, is, is actually studying this very carefully, and, and you can read several of their reports if you go to their website. Twitter not only has that very basic search feed that you saw in, her, in her earlier slide, there's also an advanced Twitter search. And you can see that many of the strategies we learned um, early on in this course um, actually are, are searchable or usable within Twitter. And so you can search the and all these words, the exact phrase, which would have been um, the quotation marks, any of these words, the ors, none of these words, the eliminating of noise, of not, um, you can search by hashtag, which really form descriptors or subject headings in that folksonomy approach. Uh, you can search by language, um, and you can search for people, um, places, of course. And then I think an interesting thing down below, which you're going to see across social media, and I'll just mention it here so you're aware of it, is the sentiment searching. Somehow by, the, by um, a combination of things, and especially emojis, um, you can actually um, get a sense of the sentiment, how people are feeling positive or negative um, or curious about the tweet. And you can also filter by eliminating retweets, which can get very noisy. But the sentiment search is kind of interesting and emerging. Um, if you're crazy on Twitter like I am, you are going to need to organize your feeds and the hashtags that you like to follow. And so I use TweetDeck, which is a free tool. It can be on your desktop, or you can use it on the web or your, your um, other mobile devices. Um, but you can see that I'm looking at my basic feed, which is everything on the left, TL Chat. I've created a search for that. Um, there's my mentions and, and real notifications and messages. I am actually tweeting with the hashtag for our class um, and for my other class as well. I am probably the most active tweet, Twitter, tweeter, <laughs> tweeter on those feeds, but just so you know, and if you feel like joining in, it's certainly not required, but hashtag are you 530 for the greater good. Uh, share your search discoveries there too, or follow me or anybody in our class. A powerful thing um, that folks do is create Twitter lists. So if you have a number of people you're following, you can organize them into lists. And this is handy for your own personal knowledge management. However, it's even more handy when you search somebody important and you see what kinds of Twitter lists they have. So how are they categorizing the people that they're following? So it's easy to make a list. You just find the, the little list icon, and there you see on the, on the right, you can keep your list public or private. So know that people are um, probably putting you on their Twitter list if you're active in Twitter, um, and you may not even know about it if it's a private list, but you can also leverage the public lists um, that other people create and use them to help you build your network or to find information. If you have found, like, it, this is almost like citation chaining, so if you find a great person to follow on Twitter, um, see what their lists look like and then grab folks off their lists, um, kind of like citation style. Um, in your playlist this week, you're going to see some people who can really tell you how deep the LinkedIn search is. I am not an expert, although I have used the search there. You can see the advanced people search um, has a lot of functionality. Um, there is more pull downs than I'm showing you here. Um, and you can see the uh, faceted search also on the left. Um, people use this for headhunting, for finding experts, um, for figuring out who the, who the top person in an area of knowledge is. And so 
Um, you can certainly also search, the, we'll look at social scholarship too, we'll look at Mandalay and ResearchGate, but um, this is an amazing people search um, and you can subscribe to have even more power in your search or you can use the basic search. Flickr, of course, is an image search as well as a video search. Um, in the regular search, you can search by relevance um, and you can search by license, creative commons, uh, commercial use allowed, and you can also search for government works, um, a variety of different licenses. Um, if you move to advanced search, you're able to search by the orientation of the image, the size of the image, the date the image was taken, um, the content, whether it's photo or video, um, you can search by the tags people have assigned to the image or the video. Um, you can also search by color, as you can see, and that's similar to kind of the Google color search. Um, note that you can search for specific people, um, and there are some wonderful photographers who you might be interested in following who do really beautiful work and make their images available through Creative Commons licenses. Finding them is, is kind of wonderful. Uh, it's important to know that it's not only individuals who are posting on Flickr. Um, many museums and libraries have extensive collections. The Library of Congress, for instance, the Smithsonian. And um, on the right there, you'll see my search for museums on uh, Flickr. And you can see that many of the major museums around the world have their images, um, or at least some of their images, in groups um, and um, albums on Flickr. You'll also find that people are putting visual content on Instagram. This is Gwyneth Jones, the Daring Librarian, who is a middle school librarian and documents much of her day on Instagram. But it's also good for searching ideas. As a professional, you're looking for what other librarians are doing. Um, but the average patron or user might also be interested in some of the collections that are being shared on Instagram. Uh, New York Public Library is famous for its sharing on social media and Instagram is one of its major platforms. Uh, Pinterest is another exciting visual space to search. Many of us use it in our casual lives and for our leisure, but it's uh, for librarians, it's a lifesaver. Uh, this is Betsy Diamond Cohn's uh, uh, Finger Plays collection. She's an expert in, in preschool um, learning, and this would be just such a beautiful tool for any public children's librarian or anybody who deals with preschoolers. And then when you're looking for inspiration, I know a lot of people look for inspiration for their weddings, but think about the inspiration you can get for bulletin boards and displays and furniture purchasing. Um, there's so much you can find on Pinterest in that regard. You can use YouTube as a search tool. Again, this is something we often use casually. Some of us have our own YouTube channels and playlists. You've seen them in this class. But they're also very important search tools. Vi video information is, is critical information. It's, uh, it competes with print. It's pretty fabulous uh, and rich. And much of it now has easy transcripts available or made available automatically through YouTube and can be uh, scanned and searched. Uh, there, some of the major organizations or, so, or uh, government agencies um, have um, YouTube channels, rich YouTube channels. You'll find um, them for, from the American Library Association, uh, but you'll also find that the government has YouTube channels. The White House has a YouTube channel. Uh, notably, C-SPAN has a really rich uh, a YouTube channel of all that's going on um, in, across government. So please take a look at that and note the filters that are searchable in YouTube have to do with the upload date, the type of uh, search that you're doing, whether it's a playlist search, a channel search. Searching channels can be very helpful. And when you're in a when you're in some somebody's uh, YouTube uh, account, um, see what they've got in their channels and playlists because they're generally more organized. You can search by duration. This is helpful if you're a teacher and you want a short film to introduce a lesson. And you can search by the type of film and the license attached to it. 
And you can also sort by relevance, um, which would include the upload date, the rating, and the view count to see which is the most popular. There are so many um, places. I, I didn't go to Snapchat. I didn't go to an awful lot of the other ones. But I just want you to begin to think about tools that are social media tools that really function very well as search tools. And while we're doing that, you can actually use some tools that are tools that are for uh, going across social media search. Social Mention is one of those, and it will search across uh, Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, Google+, which is now going away, Pinterest, YouTube, Tumblr, and Flickr. And so think about that and also think about using at signs and hashtags within Google as a tool for social media search. Let's shift gears a little bit, uh, still on the notion of social media, but also on a more specific area um, that people are calling crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing um, is the process of getting work or funding, usually online, from a crowd of people. The word is a combination of the words crowd and outsourcing. The idea is to take work and outsource it to a crowd of workers. Um, the wisdom of the crowd, if you like. One of the oldest and possibly the most popular sites where questions and conversations are crowdsourced is Reddit. Reddit functions very nicely as a search tool, and I wanted to play a little introduction to Reddit for you. If Facebook is your hometown, think of Reddit like a foreign country. You don't speak the language, the customs are odd, and you probably don't know what's going on. But spend some quality time with the front page of the internet, and you'll find it's an essential resource, a self-regulating marketplace of ideas. Simply put, Reddit is a message board where users submit links. Items of value are upvoted, and those deemed unworthy are downvoted. The number of upvotes minus the number of downvotes determines a post's score, with the most upvoted content eventually making its way to the coveted front page. Content on the front page has already been vetted, voted, and discussed by thousands of other Redditors. These are things that'll make you laugh, think, and motivate you to dig a little deeper. Every link posted to Reddit goes into a subreddit related to that subject. Subreddits are more niche communities that you can subscribe to, and there are subreddits for almost anything. When viewing a subreddit, you may notice that posts with the highest score do not always rank to the top. This is due to Reddit's time decay algorithm, which, to put it simply, makes it easier for newer posts to rise. However, you can sort content based on newest, top scoring, and most controversial. A subreddit isn't just a place to dump links, it's a thriving community unto itself with its own customs, lingo, and moderators. It's where everyone knows your name, except they don't because most Redditors are anonymous. It's this anonymity that makes Reddit a safe place for open discussion. But, like the internet itself, anonymous platforms can be a source for good just as much as they can be a source for My Little Pony fan porn. The comment system on Reddit is arguably the most important and often most entertaining part of the site. The upvote-downvote system used for posts are also used for comments, so in theory the most valuable discussion will always make its way to the top. Reddit karma is an accumulation of goodwill you receive when other users upvote your posts or comments. It doesn't give you any overt influence, and it can't be cashed in for fabulous prizes, but a healthy amount of karma on your profile alerts other users that you add value to the community. There are a number of other crowdsourced types of websites. Um, this is challenge.gov, in which citizens are getting involved in uh, citizen science to solve problems for our country. And you can take a look at some of the challenges that are posted, and these are updated, and um, maybe even get students involved if you're working with students. Other examples um, include Micropasts, which is, it, this makes absolute sense, it's about crowd fueling and crowd sourcing um, archaeological data, um, getting involved in research projects that need human intelligence, such as the accurate location of artifacts um, and find spots or photographic scenes. Uh, if you're interested in archaeology, take a look at this and maybe get involved. 
The Encyclopedia of Life is another crowdsourced um, project supported by the Atlas of Living Australia, Harvard University, and a number of other well-respected institutions. Um, what the vision is, is global access to knowledge about life on Earth, and the mission is to increase awareness and understanding of living nature uh, through the Encyclopedia of Life that gathers, generates, and shares knowledge in an open, free, freely accessible, and trusted digital resource. And this is about um, flora and fauna and all the species around with images that come from the community um, when they see uh, a, a, an animal that is not necessarily always seen in an area. It has maps, it has video, it has Latin names, and it's a very exciting project. So you're going to be sending patrons and students perhaps to um, major medical portals, and we'll be exploring those as well. But you may be interested also in the communities that are out there. One example is patients like me, uh, in which people share their symptoms, treatment information, and health outcomes. Uh, and Patients Like Me is a really supportive community and you can go in under any condition or disease and have conversations with people in those communities. In addition, the site turns the data that, about the disease, uh, in, well, turns the, uh, the information into data and organizes the data to, um, to create insights. And then they share what they learn. Um, uh, their philosophy is give data, get data. Um, you want to be uh, sure that patrons are aware of all of the norms of the community, privacy issues as well. But again, this is a source of information for patients that may be different from the medical information that is the standard textbook type, really understanding and learning from other people who have similar conditions. So keep that one in mind. Um, We'll be looking at the Smithsonian in a while. It is one of the major institutions that is seeking digital volunteers to crowdsource work uh, that has to do with making historical documents and, by, and, in this case, biodiversity data more accessible. So they use what they're calling volunteers to transcribe documents and add tags and locally relevant information. These are exciting projects because there is so much content that needs to be um, made accessible. Another one of the health and medical projects is CrowdMed, and this is interesting. It provides a collaborative approach for, prob uh, for solving complex medical cases online. And um, there are multiple parties involved. Uh, so what happens is the knowledge of the case-solving community allows patients to explore um, all possible medical diagnoses and solution, providing a clear path for them to, to follow towards a cure. And so there are patients who are there, and there are also what they call medical detectives. Um, and those detectives include licensed physicians, medical students, physicians assistants, chiropractors, scientists, neuropaths, um, and healthcare aficionados. And each case is overseen by a case moderator who is carefully vetted and a licensed physician. Um, and it's an interesting site uh, to cure unusual medical, to address uh, unusual medical situations. And on a lighter note, um, we have um, Instructables, one of my favorite crowdsourced places where um, people who have secret skills are creating um, videos and lessons and courses. Let me play a little bit for you on what Instructables looks like. And as you're thinking about this, Instructables is a place that lets you explore, think about document, and uses share in libraries. Whether you like to tinker with LEDs and breadboards, fancy an afternoon of fiber arts, prefer to get your hands dirty in the garden, or spend your weekends in the workshop, everyone has something to share, including you. To create an instructable, make something and document it as you go. It can be as simple or complex as you like.
using the app or your computer, upload your photos or videos, and explain how you made it. Publish your Instructable and join our welcoming community. It's people like you that make this site a great place to share ideas. Now get out there and make something. So that's one of my favorites, sorry. And um, you'll also find all sorts of life hack sites. Uh, and, and those are really interesting for solving practical problems. And you will have questions from patrons and students on how to do something. That knowing that these sites exist, including the life hack sites um, that are crowdsourced, might be very useful in helping them answer their questions. And speaking of answering questions, uh, there are a number of communities that really function as a Q&A kind of site. Ask FM is one such site. It is a site where people anonymously ask and answer questions. Not all the questions are exactly for um, younger people. Uh, I, I've had problems, problems with this one at the high school where one of my students was actually a question answer and in a little bit of um, an illicit uh, arrangement. But um, so you want to be careful about some of these sites, but I just want you to be aware that these exist. Ask FM is actually moving into a premium kind of area where people will use either Bitcoin or some kind of token to uh, to pay for premium um, questions being answered, including having celebrities answer their questions. Anyway, let's just go to the, an extension of all of this crowdsourcing and social media is you really have to work very hard to, fall alone, to feel alone these days. Um, many of, of us are parts of what's called virtual communities, groups of people who may or may not meet each other face to face, who exchange words and ideas through the mediation of computer bulletin board systems and other digital networks. And Howard Rangold, who's pictured there, is um, one of the first per people, scholars, to write about virtual communities when he talked about the well in California a long time ago. I've had the honor to, to meet and interview Har um, Howard, and it's, he's just a delight. Um, in terms of education, um, there are so many online communities of practice for educators and um, it talks in this article about why um, why they're popular um, and how they can be better. We talk about the PLNs and they're either called personal learning networks, sometimes professional learning networks um, and that's how many of us connect with other people around the world uh, based on our professional interests. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, George Seaman and Stephen Downs, who are bloggers I know, um, talk, talked of this as a learning theory called connectivism. And indeed, I think I've learned more uh, talking to strangers over the last 10 years than I've learned in my entire life because of the rich connections I make through my personal learning network. If you create a good personal learning network, you will be led to all the fabulous content, uh, content and tools for which you really have passion. And so um, please, um, I was, I've was i been serious all semester about building your PLN. Um, in education and in the library world, um, that chat from EdTech Magazine is a list of some of the um, t popular Twitter hashtags in education. I'm really proud that somewhere in the middle towards the bottom in purple is the hashtag TLChat. And this was about popularity and back in 2013. So if you can see, back in 2010, I started that hashtag. And then my students, uh, three years later, started TLLM. It's not as, as robust, but it is a place for teacher librarians uh, who work with elementary age children uh, to connect. And if you want to, you can make that even more robust by using it when you tweet. Um, these hashtags are big deals. I'm giving you just um, the example of education, but participate.com is a relatively new site that allows you to curate. Um, I've mentioned that in the other, um, the other lecture, but it's an example of how to discover hashtags, and there's a number of ways to do this. Um, I'm going to ask you during in our discussion this week to help me build a list of MI or LIS hashtag, hashtags and at signs by, by searching around in some of these places. 
but I, I'm hoping we can crowdsource this list and you can use it for some of your niche interests um, in your profession. Um, these hashtags um, and communities are also good um, for when you get stuck. So you can pull together using uh, using Twitter. You can pull together a very quick poll. So I created my poll in Google Forums, um, but you can there is a Google polling tool. Um, and basically, I found the hashtags I needed when um, the head of the English department, or um, actually head of curriculum, asked me. Um, what is the most popular citation uh, format or style used at the university level? And so I found myself um, like almost overnight with 307 responses from the university library community, and um, and they uh, and they responded to my question, and I was able to pull together um, which style. And again, it really the the answer was it depended on what department you're from. So it varied, and so we kept using APA for science and MLA for humanities, and so we actually didn't solve the problem. We solved the problem by uh, by using more than one. In any case, I've also um, had folks help me collaborate on things by just putting it out on Twitter, and this happens all the time. So um, some of my best friends are on Twitter, and, and actually I've met them in meetups when uh, when I've been traveling. So. We were all the way out in Australia, and my, my Twitter community um, met me for lunch, um, all the, the Aussie librarians. It was really fun. Um, there are other collaborative platforms, especially for answering research data uh, questions. Um, and this is DataQ, so you can, um, you can crowdsource some of the tougher questions that you get. Um, Courtney Young about crowdsourcing the virtual reference interview um, and, and, and how she gets out there and reaches out to people to, um, to help her with the tough questions. Uh, she writes that um, it's becoming a major resource for librarians to discuss the best way to approach a query with another librarian and sometimes recruit librarians in a, who have particular areas of expertise to help answer questions. Uh, bringing in an authority with a specialized subject area right into the interaction. So um, I want you not to think that you're alone in terms of tough questions out there. Um, this is Purdue University, and they decided that they were going to game a reference. And so they crowdsourced question answering, um, and, um, and there's a kind of tally board for who's answering what well and, and, and quickly. So um, it, this would not be for the most complicated questions, but um, for, the, for the easier stuff, you can have upperclassmen kind of involved in this and just read the article and see how they did that. There's a darker side to this question answering using Twitter hashtags, and one of those is a kind of unofficial interlibrary loan, and you may f there might be all sorts of controversy about how you feel about this, but there is a hashtag out there called uh, hashtag I can has PDF, where folks who don't have access to particular databases and journals um, request that for people who do have access to databases and journals, and so they're getting beyond the firewalls to, he to share proprietary PDFs. Um, and um, this is part of, I guess you could call it part of the, the dark web a little bit, but um, you can, you can try, search that hashtag and see what it looks like when people are asking for things. And we're also talking about what, um, what it's like when you crowdsource your library catalog. Do you think of this box or what its virtual representation is uh, as an inventory, or do you think of it as a community? Is it a website or a catalog, and are they both hubs? You'll meet Louise Spateri this week, um, and she's written a number of articles in a book on the social catalog. Uh, in this particular article, she notes with her uh, co-writer, Chiruli, that the library catalog is social space or online community draws together elements of trust, interaction, contribution, discoverability, personalization, and customization, intuitiveness, belonging, and immediate access to information. In all, they, call, they create a level of experience that has been up until now only found in a physical library. And I'll get your feeling about that this week when you meet Louise in her voices of search on the social catalog. So summing up, 
This week, we looked at social media for search, social media search tools, communities of practice online, crowdsourcing, and you will be looking at curation for search and personal knowledge management. And let's get together again next time when we look at the all-important notions of credibility, authority, evaluation, and as we say, say in the ACRL frames, in what ways is authority constructed and contextual? We'll look at Rangold again as he talks about crap detection. And we'll also look at news literacy in a 24-7 news cycle. So thank you very much, and I'll see you in the threads.